Welcome to the Fit Dad Nation podcast, forging strong fathers and raising a stronger generation. It's time to get up, man up, or shut up with your host, Steve Roy. Hey guys, this is Steve Roy. I'm the host of the Fit Dad Nation podcast. I want to welcome you to the show. And today I'm really excited to speak with somebody named Anthony Trucks. Now, Anthony is a former NFL player. He was an American Ninja Warrior competitor. He is a best-selling author, international speaker, gym owner, a fitness entrepreneur, consultant, and coach. And I've spoken to him a couple of different times. And in all honesty, I can say that he's just he's just a hell of a guy. And we've done some coaching together. And I'll tell you straight up, this man is the real deal. He's authentic, genuine, and he knows his shit when it comes to business, branding, marketing, and hustling. So, Anthony, welcome to the show. I appreciate that you're here with us. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm looking forward to rapping with you, man, getting some, some good info for your listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So I got to say, I just I just love your passion and enthusiasm. And if if anybody's listening has has seen him, heard him, it's just contagious. And you can't help but smile and just kind of get fired up. And it's just one of the things that I, I really find so fascinating about you. So you have a lot going on. You've done a lot of really cool things. But other than the obvious of being a, an, an elite athlete and, and some other business stuff, what really struck me as such a, a powerful thing about you is, is your backstory and your childhood. And I was hoping to kind of get some thoughts about kind of your upbringing. And, and I know you're kind of an open book when it comes to this stuff. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't ask. But yeah, if you don't mind, maybe just jumping into kind of how it all started for you. That would be awesome. Yeah, man. Let's just go back to the beginning. <laughs> for me, my life is not the typical or the norm. It's odd. So I'm in the world of entrepreneurship now. It's kind of what I, I love to do because I like creating. And I like helping people create and put something out in the world. But I, I found that I became an entrepreneur at three years old. And it's a really odd thing to hear from most people. But it's <laughs> not that I was actually out there selling things, but it's an emotional thing. So if you think about entrepreneurship, it's that that first thought of, okay, I'm going to go do this thing that's scary. It's brand new. Uh, I don't know what tomorrow brings. I have no idea how to navigate this. It's just you pretty much get, get kind of pushed into this world that's scary. And our heart does that. Like our heart says there's something more that we want to go see, achieve, freedom, time, whatever it is. And so that's how you go get it. For me, my, my life started with my mom giving me away into foster care, me and my three siblings. So my first memory is my mom literally giving me to some strange woman and having those exact same emotions of being scared of what tomorrow brought, not knowing what to do, you know, having this forced out feeling like we're an entrepreneur's heart does that. My mom did that. And it left me in this complete whirlwind for many years of just feeling lost and angry and, and scared and, and worthless. And so a lot of my childhood was just spent hating the world, man, like not really feeling like I was part of it or belonged because the one person that's supposed to love me doesn't. So why am I here? You know, I'm no good. And I think it's kind of the biggest battle I had to fight growing up. And, and from about the age of three to six, I dealt with starvation and, and beatings and tortures in a bunch of different homes because the foster care system in the early mid 80s was not very good. It's still getting better, which is good. And from there, I got adopted by an all white family. So I had a whole lot of weird things that I had growing up just because of it was a racial divide, you know, not that they were racist, which they obviously weren't, but just the societal aspects of how that looked and this family raising me. And they did a good job, I fully believe, because I'm, in my mind, a great guy doing some great things in the world. But I think there was that aspect to it. But the big part of my life was transitioning to something where it gave me a sense of self-worth and taught me how to work, which is the most important things that I think are necessary to do anything of greatness in this world is to have self-worth and know how to work. If you don't believe in yourself, have that self-worth, you're not going to work. And if you do, but don't know how to work, you're going to be lazy. You're going to be a person that should have, could have, but never did. And so I, I ventured into this thing called football that most people don't think is big, but at 14 years old, it was huge because it was the first time I could play any sports. Mm -hmm. I went out and I sucked really bad. <laughs> like I was <laughs> I was horrible, man. Like I was not great at this game, but I loved it. Like, and that's what we end up running into in life. A lot of us have these things that we love, but we're not that great at it yet. And because of that, we find great excuses to then do something else or to give up on the dream. And it allows us to simply sleep better at night. The excuse is good because then you can go to sleep at night and feel better. And I got to a point where I was, I was checked out. My adoptive mom got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis like a year after I got adopted. I was playing football. I wasn't very good, but loved it. My older brother went off to the military. And so I'm sitting there as this kid who statistically as a former foster kid is not supposed to do much. Like if you look at any prison in America, 75% of the inmates are former foster kids. I think 1% or less of foster kids ever graduated from college. So the numbers aren't set up for me to do much successfully except for be a criminal. 
Mm-hmm. So I decided like, I'm going to be that guy. And I remember I was sitting in a class. It was Mr. Howell's English class. And it was this moment where I was like half asleep, had a, a black jacket over my head, eating breakfast, which was a bag of cinnamon toast crunch. And these two girls were sitting next to me and they have no idea I'm listening to them. And it was this simple statement that shifted everything and literally made me determine who I want to be for the future. And her statement was, well, the reason I'm so bad is because I'm in foster care. And as much as it's a simple statement, for me, it was the moment when somebody had made my excuse verbal and said it out loud. I was like, that sounds bad. And and a lot of the times we don't have the opportunity and we were looking for some big slap in the face to wake up. And for me, it was that like, wow, that's how I'm going to sound when I'm 30 and I'm a criminal or I'm a bad dad or I beat my wife. If I go this path and I just kind of stick on this journey I'm going down, I was like, I don't want that to be me. And so what I did is I went home and I said, I'm going to be great. I had no idea what great was. And most of us, when we make a decision to be great, we don't really know what great is. We just know great is something more. But there's that scary thought of, well, what if I can't get great? What if I'm not good enough for great? And and for me, I realized this thing that I try to impress upon people at all levels is you have to get to a point where you comprehend that there's there's going to be zero guarantees that if you put in the work, you become successful. You can put all the work in you want and you can still fail. But if you don't, I guarantee you fail. You're not going to luck into a great business or a great marriage or a great body. It doesn't happen. It takes work. The crazy part is because everybody realizes those two choices. Most people, they don't want to put the work in with a chance of failure, so they don't do work, which means those who decide to, actually the odds are way better. When you put work in, things work out. It's like rocket science. Like, (laughs) oh, but it does. And, And not only that, but every time you put work into something and you find out a new solution or a new thing, you bring that tool to the next problem. So little by little throughout my life, I was able to, to, from just that moment, figure out how to work. I came back the next year in football. I was a monster. I was faster, stronger. I was just a better athlete because I learned to work in the off season, having no guarantee of success. But I learned how to be successful. So I was able to go from this lowly freshman that sucked to a sophomore playing on varsity a few years later, got a scholarship to play football at the University of Oregon on scholarship. Four years later after that, I started my true sophomore year in college over a five-year senior, balled on him. I went to play in the NFL for three years, tore my shoulder, came home, opened a gym that went to be like a 9,000 square foot gym, 20 employees, started consulting for hundreds of thousands of dollars, started writing books, speaking around the world, doing online courses and started coaching people. And now I, I'm an eclectic base of a bunch of weird, fun stuff. I've been on TV shows doing American Ninja Warrior. Like I, I, I realized that every single step along the way, it was nothing more than me saying, what do I got to do to get this next thing to be successful? And all it was was taking that step. And the reason I took a step was I realized that there's going to be problems at the next step of the journey. There's going to be. But because of the last steps you've gone through, you've got tools. So you bring you to the next problem, no matter what it is. When it happens, you bring you to that problem and you have a lot of tools because you just keep on picking them up because you're the one that has the gumption to keep going forwards. And so that's how my life's been moving and chugging along. And I I don't see it slowing down anytime soon. I just I I keep picking up and rolling. And because of that mentality, I love life because I get to make life what I want it to be. Wow, that's quite a story, quite a book there. So you went from basically age 15 is when kind of things turned around there and you just hit it. It's just amazing that given your upbringing, you were strong enough, mentally strong enough or focused enough to to do that. I mean, I, I don't think most people that were raised, you know, in a quote unquote, stable, loving, happy family, they don't pull that stuff off. And you've gone way beyond the social norms of success. And you've really kind of knocked the ball out of the park in multiple areas, not just a superstar athlete, but you know, I mean, you're businesses and and now you've got your own family and you're traveling the world and doing all kinds of great things. But most importantly, I mean, you're doing stuff you love and you're helping yeah. thousands and thousands of people live better. Yeah, that's the goal. Just in our few conversations that we've had in the past, I mean, the way you speak about business and life and and it's just so inspiring. It's just, you know, a very unique individual. I may mean, have a lot of respect for you, a ton of respect for you. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. So stepping back just a little bit. So you played for the Skins, you played for the Bucks and the Steelers, yeah. and you were 24 when you ended up destroying your shoulder and that was it? Is that yeah. correct? Well, I didn't know at the time. Usually at the time, it's like, oh, it's an injury. I can keep on going. I torn my right shoulder in college. So my assumption was, oh, I'll just get this thing fixed and go back. But it never got fixed. Like it never really came back. And then on top of that, when you're in the NFL, you got to think about this. Every year, there's about 10,000 new people entering the draft. At your position, there's got to be, you know, let's say 500. 
So for you to be able to stay in there, like they got to look at you and say, you are worth the money and worth the chance over a guy that's young, fresh, and they can pay less. So for me, it's like, well, I got this shoulder injury. Mm -hmm. I'm three years in, you know, I I have this skill set, but I'm not this big name. I'm just a dude. And so uh, at a certain point, I had to make a decision because what they were offering me was, yeah, we'll go ahead and let you sign. But if for some reason your shoulder gets hurt again, that's on you. We don't pay for surgery. We're not taking care of anything, me, us or the NFL. And that's something that you can't make the decision with a family. Because if for some reason I get my shoulder hurt and I can't use my arm again, I can't pay for it, which means that I can't even have a regular job if I go home. Mm-hmm. So I had to had to actually just hang the jersey up, which was like, no lie, I cried, man. Like it was to, to know that what I'd spent my entire life doing, which gave me a sense of self-worth, was now gone. That's a tough pill to swallow. And I think a lot of guys that are in my position, they, they have that same emotional experience. And it's difficult because you have to figure out well, who in the world am I if I'm not this, this guy that everybody knew me to be. And that was a big transition for me. Yeah, no doubt. I was actually going to ask you that exact question to see how you handled it. So how long did it take you to recover from that life change and then ultimately end up doing what you're doing now, which is you know yeah. fitness entrepreneurship? So first I came home and my degrees in kinesiology. So I'm like, I'm going to do this, you know, crazy thing. I'm going to open a gym, you know, that's what football players do. So I did mm-hmm. that same thing yeah. and doing so, man, it was, you got to think none of us, we come out of that situation. We have any business skills. We have no job skills. All we've known is football. So I have a skill set that I'm unable to use in the rest of the world because all I've done is tackle people for a living. <laughs> so it doesn't transition well. Mm-hmm. And the big thing for me was trying to figure out how can I take these intangible skill sets that I've accumulated over the years, which is you know my ability to work and focus and drive, how do I apply that in a non-physical way? And that was the big key was figuring out how to take all the stuff that I'd learned and shift it. And that was the best thing for me to transition. It was no longer me trying to be the fastest, strongest, and almost be, be mindlessly working. Because in football, you can kind of mindlessly work. You can go to the gym, here's my sheet of paper, lift the weights. But when it comes to working in business, it's focused mental work. It's it's like being in a football play all day long. And we don't like doing that. Football players, like, we like to know the plays and everything. But mm-hmm. I don't want to spend my entire day having to look at, you know, film. Like, it's tiring. But that's kind of what it is. And the transition for me was tough. It took me years to figure out, to be honest. Honestly, directly affected my marriage. I ended up losing my marriage at the time. We're back together now, holding the conversation. We got divorced for about three years. But I was so focused on trying to create this this business that was, you know, going to give me credibility, which as men, we want that respect. We want that credibility that I was neglecting the entire base of why I was doing, it, which was my family. My family was the reason I was working and I would say that out loud. But then when I was living my life, my actions didn't show that I was at the gym more than I was at home. And I was spending more time with people, my other clients than I was with my own kids. And that just wasn't, it wasn't being shown through my actions that that was important to me. And it was all because I was trying to be Anthony, the gym owner, as opposed to Anthony, who happens to own a gym. Mm-hmm. Sure. So, so you have three kids. How old are you now? Um, thirty-four. Okay. So you have three kids, right? In, uh, a set of twins in there. Yep. Got eight-year-old twins and a thirteen-year-old son. Okay. So you got divorced, <laughs> split up, and now you're back together. Are you remarried, or are you just together? Yeah. We're actually, it's odd. We're like it's legally not married, but we're technically married. I don't know how to explain it, man. We wear <laughs> right. rings. We're we're married. It's what okay. marriage you're gonna get. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a great scenario, though. I mean. No one goes into a marriage wanting to divorce. And if you can make it work with the mother of your children, I mean, all power yeah. to you, of course. I mean, it doesn't happen very it's often. But So you've transitioned. You went and became the gym owner, the fitness guy. You know, you have obviously a lot of credibility. Just slap your name up there. And obviously it, it sells because you're a, a superstar. And, you know, you're an NFL player. So, I mean, that's yeah. obviously huge. But it seems like you've transitioned more into lifestyle coaching. This trust your hustle is is part of your brand. And but it seems like you're leaning towards helping people you know, just live fuller lives, be happier, you know, follow their passions and, and whatever that may be. Maybe it's not necessarily fitness or an online business or whatever, but I've read a couple of quotes that I'll share in a minute that I, I read that you wrote. So is that kind of where your business is now? Yes. I guess there's two heads of the snake. One head is, is the idea of like, I want to help people create stuff. Because I think for me, the only thing that's given me like a sense of drive and passion, honestly, the self-worth is what I've created. I mean, a lot of people go and see motivational speakers from a standpoint of like, I'm going to go get a pump up. But the truth is like, when you go home, if you really are going to have that pump up stay, it's because you created something. You get to stand back and say, look at this thing I made. Like, this is your podcast. You made this podcast. You made it happen. Like that's, you sit back and sit back. Like these great conversations you have, which you share with the world, that's you. I can't, I can't do anything to motivate you more than that, that feeling you have when it's all said and done and loaded. And somebody sends an email like, 
Steve, dude, thank you so much for having this person on. Like, that's you. And that is something that no one can touch. So it's a part of me that loves giving that moment to people because when you have it, it's addictive. Like, gosh, this is what I can do. Like, I'm, it gives you a better sense of purpose. And I think as human beings, we're always searching for a purpose, whether it's being a great mom or dad or a cousin, brother or whatever it might be or coach. So there's that aspect to it. Then the other side of it is realizing that some people, they have no desire to create something. Their, their idea for creating something is, can I just, you know, create a better life and be a better mom or dad? I don't want to open a business. And so there's those two heads of the snake is one, I want to teach people to create something in the business space. But then the other side is like the heart of me says that, hey, I want to help someone who doesn't have any aspirations of building something, making something. They want to have a job, but they want to live a great life. And within both those areas, the concept of trusting your hustle still rings true. Sure, sure. So I read something you said. It said, my goal is giving people tools that will help them to be happy. Happiness means something different to everybody. So I just want to provide the tools that help. And so this is something that I'm very passionate about is the whole subject of happiness. It's kind of cliche, right? You know, find your happy. But so many people, I mean, millions and millions of people just go through their lives just getting by, doing the bare minimum, never really think about, hey, am I actually happy? Do I, do I wake up and I'm energized by my life or is it just sucking the life out of me one day at a time? Mm-hmm. And I did that for years and it took a lot of life out of me. And it took a huge life turnaround for me, a divorce, leaving my career of 12 years in finance mm-hmm. and, and reinventing myself to, to actually find my happy place. And right now my relationship with my kids is better than it's ever been. I'm in a very loving and supportive relationship with an awesome woman. Awesome. And those things would never have been possible had I not pursued those things and really did some deep discovery on myself. And and I know that's also very important to you. Mm -hmm. Hugely important to me. I I think the problem with a lot of us as men is like, I I got to a point where, you know, I'd lost my marriage. My wife had, you know, she had cheated on me. To be honest, that was a situation. And I Mm -hmm. I felt worthless and I felt bottled down as a man in this world. We're not allowed to speak very much. Like we're not allowed to share our feelings, you know, and it's an odd thing. And then for me, I realized like I, I had this chip in my shoulder. I haven't been the former NFL athlete and I own this gym. Like people can't see me sweat. And it was that mentality that killed me. It stopped me from allowing myself to get better because whether a guy says it or doesn't say it, girl, whoever it is, we have emotions and they suck to deal with. And so we try to, we try to tuck them away, but they don't go away. It's, it's like a, a, a ball against the wall. You can smack it away. It's coming right back at you faster. And so the big thing that most people don't realize is you got to just express it, navigate it. And the first step to doing that is admitting. Like everybody knows the first step to follow up open problem is just saying I got a problem. Mm-hmm. And I think the steps that allowed probably you to be where you're at and me to be where I'm at is the moment that I stepped back and said, damn, but like I'm not perfect. And hey, I need some help. And giving yourself permission to do so and, and kind of getting to a level of – honestly, it sucks, but almost a rock bottom sometimes. But it takes a rock bottom to shift. And I, I really wish I could teach people – to not have to go to the rock bottom to have to experience that shift or change. Just realize where you're headed. <laughs> like if you if you can take a look down the, the periscope and say, well, I'm, I'm heading towards this damn iceberg. I probably don't want to hit it. How do I stop that? Because you can either do that or run into the iceberg and then you have a reason. And I think we're always looking for some big catastrophic reason. You don't have to have a reason to make a change. Just realize that the reason's coming. And if you can do that and just get some help, then things move better. And it's not so much that your life sucks. Like I think people, there's a a vast difference between, I think people think there's either I'm happy or I'm unhappy. So if somebody says, are you happy? Are you good? Yeah, I'm good. Because the opposite for them is just unhappy when I believe it's a massive gray space. So some people may not be incredibly unhappy, but they're not incredibly happy and they're in that gray space in between. And when they're sitting in that gray space, they're slowly eking towards unhappy, not aware of it until they hit that wall. And so if we can at least have people say, look, I'm, I'm not the happiest moods. So I'm not the greatest mood in the world, you know, but I'm not completely unhappy, but I'm sitting here somewhere in between funky and I don't want to be funky anymore. I want to be a little bit happier and I want to find out how to do that, what that looks like. That's the first step to move in the right direction. Sure. When you were saying that, it brought to mind something that I read, it, Tim Ferriss wrote, and I'm probably getting this wrong, but I think it said something like the opposite of happiness isn't unhappiness. It's like apathy. Yeah. Basically, that's how people go through life. It's they're just kind of apathetic towards everything, right? Their their career's fine. Their marriage is mm-hmm. fine. They do the same shit every day. They, you know, they put the kids to bed, they watch all the TV, they go to bed, they wake up, they repeat, they sit in the car. It's a grind. And just you know, life is way, way, way too short to grind it out. And something you said kind of stuck with me here. And I read this and said 
the, the secret to success and happiness is keeping it real and dropping the ego that keeps you stuck between yeah. happiness and unhappiness, which mm-hmm. makes perfect sense. But the problem is, and this is especially true for men, they have the ego and it's not as simple as do yeah. just knock it off and you'll be happier. It's they have so much history that's built this wall and other than some kind of event like i personally went through a very life-changing personal growth workshop that changed my entire life but a lot of people aren't going to do that so what would you say i mean you know you meet a guy off the street he's you know a corporate executive 45 years old on paper has everything he's got all the toys the boat the bmw the nice house but you know he's, he's grinding out his life he's at his base his very level he's not a happy person, right? He's not fulfilled. You know, he's making a bunch of money, but deep down, you know, he's not happy with what he's doing because there's a lot of people listening to this that probably are in that situation. So what would you tell someone that's like that? I mean, when you first see them, I mean, how do you get them from yeah. holy ego to- <laughs> My wife hates when I do this stuff. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, so I'm the guy that does this. My wife hates when I poke at people, but really? here's what I realized. I, love I, I was, yeah, she, cause she doesn't like being around it. Ah, <laughs> cause it yeah, makes yeah. her feel awkward. Uncle. Yes. yes. Like I'll, I'll let people come to the door. Like this lady came to the door recently and uh, she does solar and she's like, Oh yeah, I, I go to your gym. Um, do you? I'm like, she's like, yeah. I said, well, why do you go to the gym? Oh, cause I want to get in shape. No, no, no. Why do you go to the gym? <laughs> My wife knew it's coming. So she kind of like eked into the house slowly. <laughs> Yeah. He's like, well, no. It's like, no, there's a reason you go to the gym. And I, I'm not here to make you feel bad, but here's what I want to tell you. If you're going to keep that journey going, you have to be able to poke in the thing that makes you damn near want to cry. Mm-hmm. And so most people, like when I get to those moments that I'm in public with people and, and you know, we have conversations, I, I'm the guy that like goes too deep too fast, but I can do it because I have a weird way of just sharing my stuff in the, in the, in a weird way of smoothly getting them to talk about their stuff. So, you know, you had the same like, how's the weather conversations. But once I tell them what I do, I have an in. Because like, oh, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm a speaker, but I help people transform lives and also make a living helping other people make a living doing what they love. Oh, how do you do that? And I said, honestly, the biggest thing is get them out of their own way. I just can start from that point. Well, how do people get in their own way? Oh, well, typically they don't realize that they're the biggest roadblock because they want to admit they got a problem. And then like, you start having the secret plan. Like, and I tell them, so at this point, like, this is how I was. When I first was started, I was this NFL guy, had a gym business, had people working for me. And then my wife cheated on me, man. It put me in a hole. Like that's, mm-hmm. that was the first thing. And it, it went that way because I wasn't opening up early enough to see I had a problem. So I was not directing the ship away when I could have. And I thought I was okay because I had the money. I had the business that I was all moving smooth, but really I wasn't happy. So what you start doing is, is telling a story that they can put themselves into. And then you get to a point where you say like, this is the situation I was in. Man, like, how are you? Like, are you anywhere in that? Do you see yourself in anywhere in that? And if they can have a moment, what you do is you get really quiet. And I'm giving you like a coaching tip right now. But when you get to that moment of asking like, hey, do you see yourself anywhere in that? You don't say a word. You let them uncomfortably speak. Psychologically, people like police officers do this. As they ask a question, they just sit there in silence. And because of the awkwardness, it's going to be either you that breaks or they break first. And mm-hmm. typically, it's the person who doesn't know they're in the silence. So, mm-hmm. so you just sit there and, and stare at them and they're eventually going to start talking. And then when they stop, if you still don't say anything, what do they do? They keep talking and people typically in the moment where they feel comfortable because you just shared a bunch of your stuff, they start sharing their stuff. And then at the end of it, they're going to have this because most people focus on the problems like what's wrong, what's not going right. Like, oh, man, I had this, this and this. So what are you doing to get away from that? Are you trying to get to a place I went or are you trying to change it before it gets there? And now little by little, you can start moving in the direction of getting them to open up. That's exactly how you do it. It sounds kind of odd, but that's how I've done it in many situations. And I'm not saying I do it every person I meet in the street, but there are situations where I may work with a client or like I'm like I have consulting gigs I do with, you know, corporations. And most of the corporations, you're talking about these big alpha male dudes. We're talking about power companies, construction companies. And these are the guys I'm dealing with dudes that just they have no idea that self-help exists. They don't care about that. I just want to go do my thing and have my big truck with the big tires and listen to cool music. That's their thing. (laughs) But they're still humans. They still got emotions and executives. I go to the office with them and they're the same thing like you said. They got money and they, they look the part and they got their smiles on. But at the end of the day, they, there's still that lack of fulfillment. There's a little bit of emptiness and there's a quick way to get it. And the first step to that quick way is just saying, I need some help. <laughs> and you got to get them to the place they feel like they can open up to that person to actually get the help. Sure. And I'll tell you that obviously it's not an easy thing for most guys to do, but given our history, looking at you, you're intimidating. You're this big muscular dude. And But speaking to you, the first thing that's clear is you care. I mean, you're the type of person that people want to 
share with, you know, I mean, within five minutes of talking to you, I'm ready to tell you my life story because I truly believe you care and it just comes across in your personality. So it's, it's a gift. I mean, not a lot of people have that where you're just willing to, wow, this guy is the real deal. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. True story. True story. So let me ask you this. I read something else. I, obviously you can tell I read quite a bit about you here. There was an article Inc. Magazine did titled, How Many People Will Be at Your Funeral? where you were featured. So when you were a kid, it was, you know, the thought was no one would be at your funeral. Nobody cares. I mean, you didn't have a loving family. And and now, is that something that you think about all the time? It's not obviously an ego thing because, wow, I was this famous guy and all these people are going to come and pay respect. It's, yeah, no. It's, it's because you've changed and impacted so many lives. Is that something that you think about every day? Yeah, oddly, more than I should, man. It's weird. This is more of a, I guess, a deep personal thing for Anthony. So growing up, I was in a situation where I got into the family I was with before I was actually adopted at 14. I was with this this family and the first dad in that home used to like beat me, beat my mom, like it was bad. And, and eventually she divorced him and life got better. Now, I wasn't adopted till I was 14, but I was in that home at the age of six. So for eight years, my mom got life better. Like she got a better job. She remarried. We got a better house. And it was scary because as it got better, little by little, I was scared that it could be taken away at any moment because I was in foster care still, which means a car could pull up at any time and just take me away. So I, I woke up until, you know, the age of 14, having no idea if the pillow I woke up on is the same one I go to sleep on. And, and so that was kind of like this weird, like unsettling thought. And it's weird in my life now that this same kind of feeling creeps in, in a sense of like, my life is great and I love what I do. And at the end of the day, like, I don't know when I'm going to go. None of us do. And so that drives me every day when I get up to like, make sure that this, this day is great as if it was my last, like legitimately to a rooted core place, not just me saying it like some meme you read, like on some mm. Facebook, it's legitimately how my life has lived. And so when you talk about who I am and how I talk, like this is me making sure that if for some reason I didn't wake up tomorrow, that this last day was a great one. And everybody I talked to appreciated and loved me and I did something great for the world. And and I think just having that mentality will lead to the place where I realize that I do I do have the ability to have an amazing and huge funeral. It's, and people, like I said, they're not going to come because I helped in business. They're not going to come because they made a quick extra buck, got some download from me. They're going to come because I helped shift their life a little bit. Mm-hmm. That's it. They're going to they're gonna get some personal connection. And so for me, every day I live my life in a sense of what I do business-wise and personal-wise. And people I meet on the street, like I want to be that guy that like, dude, this guy is just, he's nice. Like he's a real human being. Like why can't we have more of him? And I don't think it's it's bad to think that way. I think for me, the world needs more of those people. And if I'm not actively trying to be that, I'm not going to exist that way. And so, yeah, I want to have a lot of people at my funeral. And the way I do it is by doing what I'm literally doing right now, talking to you and helping the person who's listening who – is doing something in their life that maybe they, they want to shift or change or they're just in that place where they don't know what to do next. And I just want to give them that little nugget so they can change something and be like, man, that one dude, all this little few minutes I listened to him shifted something for me and and I'll leave this planet a happy man. Yeah, that's well said. And I just hope that people listening will take a moment and check your stuff out because it is life-changing stuff. And it's even more interesting that you think this way because I read that you at one point were considering taking your own life. Things were so yeah. bad. I was. How old were you? Man, about 28, 27, 28. It was, it was right after my situation with my wife. And I, had, mm-hmm. I remember I'd found out we were on a vacation and it broke me. And it broke me more so because for me, like, I have this weird tie to home because not, not having a true, like, my blood family growing up, it really, it means a lot to me, my family. Like, it's just, it's the core of my, my person. And if I'm not good at home, I'm not good outside my home. Like, if I'm fighting my wife, I, I don't belong on stage. Like, it's just not where I, I can't speak. I'm not good at, in, in talking. So we're usually always good because we navigate and figure it out. And so I got to this point where, you know, I'd lost my wife. And in doing so, I'd, I'd lost my family. And so now I'm looking at this this world of, like, I'm doing what I was happening to me. I'm, I've, you know, now going to have my kids grow up without dad in the home. And and I was broken inside. Man, I, Everything that, that meant something to me was gone. So why does my gym matter? Why does my life matter? And I remember driving off and I, I was looking for rat poison. I texted my family and friends and I said, please tell my children who their father was. And it was like this crazy moment of just weakness, man. It was it was because I got to this moment where I remember I was watching a UFC fight and my buddy Jay, who was, you know, knowing, he knew everything going on. Like, I hadn't really expressed much. I was a guy that bottled things up. I didn't want the world to know about my situation. I'd, I'd go to my gym every day and be happy and smile, but I was dying inside every moment. And and he knew it. And we were watching a fight. And he remembers, like, he's telling me in, in kind of hindsight, but he's like, dude, you were like 
just glassy eyed. He didn't talk to anybody. You were just sitting there staring at the screen. And so he walks me outside. He says, hey, man, I know there's a lot going on and it's hard for you to accept this as the situation. He says, but this is your life. This is your reality. And I think just those simple words, like it all came to, I remember getting in my car and just like this wave, like a sledgehammer in my chest, it all just hit me like a physical pain that I could not comprehend. I'd, I'd never experienced. I just, I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't breathe. And like, it was a physical pain I wanted to end, which is why I sent that message. And I remember just like, when it all took place, I was sitting in my car. Police eventually found me. I had GPS on my phone. And it was the only thing that pretty much got them to me before I could find, you know, a place to do the deed, so to speak. And and I remember going back home and, and being around my friends and family and, and for the first time kind of opening up and sharing what I was feeling inside and how the battle I was fighting. And, and there's legitimately close friends that told me, like, Anthony, man, I, I threw up. He's like, I was sick. I thought I'd lost a hero. And it's weird coming from a, like a good friend. Like, what do you mean you lost it here? I'm just your buddy. He says, no, like what you've, what you've gone through in life, what you do, who you do it for, how you show up. He's like, man, it's, it is not normal. He's like, you are not a normal human being. And I look up to you in ways you don't comprehend and to know I might've lost you. Like it, it really scared me. And I think that was a switch for me that first made me realize like I, I have more in me that I'm not even seeing. And I think a lot of us do. There's more going on inside of our, our personas that we are unaware of and how we affect people. But at the same time, we don't express the problems we have. And so because I was failing to let this out, to let the steam out, it was about to bust the pipe. And so what I've taken away from that is what I try to share with people is like, we're not perfect. Like, I don't care what pedestal you may put me on. I don't care if I've been on TV and I speak on stages. I'm still a human being. I step off the stage and I got to go eat and I got to go poop and I got to go be this dude, right? Like, this is how life is lived. And if we can stop for a moment, just tap back into the place and realize like, it's okay to be human. Like it's okay to be human, then you can start giving yourself permission to to find out how to be a better human, which is connecting with human beings, sharing the things that go on. We're made to connect. Like I'm a man that believes in God. Like we were made to have relationships. And and so if you are robbing yourself of that, you're robbing yourself of what life is really meant to be. Yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine. I haven't been around that ever, but wow. I mean, it's just, just remarkable the things you've been through. Did you share that in your book? I know you have a book, Trust Your Hustle. I honestly yeah. haven't read that, but is that one of the stories you share in there? Yeah, I, I do go into that. There's a whole lot in that book, man. I pretty much poured my soul out from every first memory to about the age of 30, right before my mom passed away. And so everything is in there and everything from the, the situation of my wife and, and that kind of whole thing. And yeah, the other book will be the back half that, that takes place after the, uh, let's just say after the storm. Well, <laughs> that one. Yeah, but it's, okay. uh, it's, it's, there's a lot in that book. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll put a link to it in the, in the show notes because I'm sure people want to check it out and I'm going to, I'm actually going to get it as well because it's I'm very interested in that. But I want to just shift gears a little bit because I have a couple more things I want to ask you and I don't want to keep you on the yeah. phone here all day long. So part of your trust, the hustle business and, and branding and messaging, it has a lot to do with this thrive type. So I, I discovered that on your website. It, yeah. You have this quiz that you go through to kind of determine your thrive type, which I've never heard about. And so I did it myself and went through it. And it's, it's kind of a neat process. I'm interested to hear a little bit more about the story on that, like how you developed it and how it's working. Trust your hustle is not just a statement. It's actually a process. And there's three steps to it. It's it's see, sacrifice, sustain. And so thrive, the the last E is actually a three. And so what I've realized is a lot of us, like you, we already mentioned to this, you kind of alluded to it earlier, is a lot of us are surviving. We're not thriving. And the problem is that we don't kind of comprehend what we have to do to start thriving in life. And, and so the whole thing of the quiz is to give you an idea of where you sit. If you don't know where you're at, you have no idea where to go. It's like saying, I want to get to a destination. Well, well where are you at is the first question. Like, if you don't know where you're at, I can't give you directions. And a lot of us are hoping to get to that end place, but we have no clue where we're actually at. We just are there. We're just existing. And so if you can start the process of figuring out where you got to begin your thing, like your whole journey – then it's easier to draw a map to the destination. And the, the thrive type allows us to get that first piece. And then the C sacrifice sustain process is the map. It's the the GPS blue line that, that gets you from point A to point B. Okay. So is that the basis for your coaching? Are you doing individual coaching right now? Yeah. So I do in the aspects of business, I'm actually doing a coaching program, like a, a group coaching program. Mm -hmm. It's called the fast entrepreneur. It's how to cut shortcut the process from stress to, to making steady income. It's pretty much it. Like how can you go from stressed out and try to get things figured out? <laughs> to make and steady income. And I'm not saying you make a million dollars a month, but if you're able to make $10, you can figure out how to make a hundred and then a thousand or whatever it needs to be. But it's a matter of getting that foundation in. But then from a standpoint of the thrive, the thrive is more of the personal development. So that's more of where I sit down with people. We, we go through a lot of different 
steps to be able to figure out where it is you're at, where you want to go and what you personally need to do to get yourself there. And that's not just me winging it. Everything I do is based on frameworks and structures that when we're going through things, I can duplicate previous results. Like a lot of people that start, you know, getting coaches that are like, I'm just going to have you hop on the phone. Like you can do it with your best friend. You and your best friend can go sit somewhere and talk on the phone. I want to get you better. And that means going through certain processes and certain steps to uncover certain things so you get good clarity and you can move in the right direction. Yeah, that's really important. I've actually hired a number of coaches over the last few years trying to help my business. And most of them, you know, you get on the phone with them and there's there's no structure. They're kind of winging it and you're, they're sharing some best practices and some tips. But, you know, when, when you and I spoke those few times, I mean, you had diagrams. There was all kinds of stuff in the background with your processes, you know, and it was very clear cut and organized. And that's one of the things that I love talking about you is there was no fluff in there. It was Boom, 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 boom. And it was all actionable stuff. And it was it was awesome. I mean. Thank you, man. That's that's the goal. Yeah, I, I realized that that's what gets people the next step. If you think about it for me, I, I take it back to sports days, like football. The teams that win aren't the teams that have the best athletes. The teams are the smartest athletes that have a, a plan they're following, a play that they're doing. So, I mean, if, if I take a look at my past, that's what I've always done. I've always had a playbook. I always know my play is, and I work the play out. But if I go out there playing park football, I'm going to get murdered. And that's what happens with a lot of people is they go get people who are playing park football and trying to figure it all out. And it's not going to work. So I'm all about processes, systems, and, and I fine tune them, but I got to have something to fine tune. It's like if you if you try to like think about workout programs, you're in fitness space. Like when it comes to creating a workout plan, if I don't know what happened last week or the week before or four weeks before and I have no plan for five weeks out, I can't change anything. I don't know what to change. So if it works, it, we just lucked out, which means I cannot duplicate that with anybody else. And I have no idea why you're better. But for me, like even when I train with athletes, I create programs and it may not be perfect in the beginning. They're pretty damn good because of my experience, my years doing it. But we still are going to tweak it. But I'll know like, hey, let's adjust the, the, the weight a little bit. Let's get you more of a rest period here. Let's change this exercise out. Let's try this rep crown. We adjust things. But now I can change something, look at the result of it and then fine tune it over time. It's exactly how I approach business. Okay. Yeah, it makes, makes sense. And obviously it's working extremely well for you. So one more thing I want to ask you, and it's in the fitness space, I would certainly would consider you a health and fitness expert, you know, been doing it for, for a long time. So here's what I'll ask. So a lot of the dads that are part of my community that are probably listening to the show are, you know, your regular dads who have nine to five jobs. A lot of them want the same things, right? They want to lose that extra 20, 30 pounds around their midsection. They want to figure out how to have more energy because they don't have any. They're stressed out. Their diet is a, a disaster. They always fall in the trap of, oh, I don't have enough time. They're full of excuses. And these are regular guys that maybe want to reclaim some of what they once had, in, you know, maybe in their college days. Maybe they weren't athletes, but they, they, you know, they want to look better for their wives. They want to feel better. They want to be around for their kids. I mean, they have a lot of things, but yeah, it's overwhelming. Like, where do I get started? There's so much misinformation. There's way too much information out there about how to do it. Me personally, I try to simplify that in my groups and, and within my community, but you know, you just, it's just everywhere. So what advice would you give to that guy on how to get their life back together from that standpoint? Yeah, I think the first thing is to minimize the overwhelm from information. So I think what we're trying to do is, is a lot of us, we're trying to figure out the, the best way to do something, but we try to do it ourselves. And, and if we do, we're following a process halfway. So for example, someone says, I want to lose weight. Well, the first thing they have to do is figure out what's the best program, what's the best nutrition, what's the best place to go and all these things. And now what they're doing is they're trying to figure out something on their own that they really probably shouldn't. They need to talk to somebody who knows because what that does is now it creates overwhelm and it literally creates an emotional feeling of negativity towards that area. So health isn't just like I'm afraid of the workout or like I'm, I don't want to go get the workout. And it's I don't want to have the mental gymnastics right now of figuring out what the heck to do with the gym. I don't want to go to the gym and wander around like a lost dog. You know, I don't want to ask somebody about a, a kettlebell, how to do this exercise. I don't want to Google or YouTube stuff. So I'm just not going to do anything. It's, it's easier to do nothing than it is to do something. So they do nothing and they find ways to – Oh, I was busy or, you know, I just I didn't have time. And like that's what ends up being the excuse because it's an easy one that nobody can argue. If you think about it, most excuse we make, no one can argue. I can't sit here and be like, no, you had time. I don't know your life. <laughs> and you know I don't know your life. So we, we're going to have an argument that's going to end pretty quick. So what I tell people is find somebody who has a process, a process that's that's been done. And that's, that's what the world is full of nowadays. Find someone as a process. It may not be the perfect process for you. But you perfect it along the way, which means maybe you don't like the exact exercise. Hey, Steve, 
can I change this exercise out? Yeah, try this. Perfect. Now we've perfected a little bit for us. And now what this does is it means that you can go in the realm of health and with your whole crazy busy life, still be crazy busy, right? It's going to be part of it outside till you fix that step. But at least with the help now, or the health area, now you can step in and you don't have to think. Like at my gym, I own a gym now, a physical gym that runs. Like I'm, I'm not always there, but it runs because of the systems I have in place. But what I know is I tell my clients when they come in, like, look, your job is to just come here and turn your brain off and just work. Mindless, just let everything relax out. Now it becomes therapy and you get a sexier body. So your brain gets to rest, your body gets to work, and then your ego gets to climb up a little bit because you feel good looking in the mirror. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. And so what people are trying to do is they're trying to create that process on their own because they think they're smart enough. No, like I'm not saying you're not smart enough, but you didn't go to school. You didn't spend years in this industry to learn what I've learned. So let me do that. I don't come to your law office and start trying to figure out how to do law. Like I'm not going to do that. Right. So let me do what I do because I spend time doing it. And then outside of that, when it comes to navigating life, a lot of the things people don't do is they think that balance is sought by adjusting time and schedule when it's really not. Balance is saying I got a full plate. What do I have to take off and put back in the pot? That's it. If you can't do something full speed, it doesn't belong in your plate right now. And then what you do is when you have these things in your plate that allow you to go full speed, you can finish them. Now it's off the plate. Now you go back for seconds and thirds and fourths. And that's kind of how you have to start shifting and adjusting things. So take things out of the area. Start saying no way more often. And then big, big anchor here is you have to figure out what you've said yes to already. So find something, a project, a hobby, something that, that really takes your time you love doing. It's your kids. Who knows what it is? And say yes to that and then have a really anchored in aspect as to why you've said yes, because now what happens is if somebody steps into your life and they hey, say, hey, you know, Steve, can you come uh, with me to this, this trip we're going to take here? We're going to go to this barbecue here. We're going to hang out at the bar. You can easily say, hey, man, I appreciate the invite, but I can't make it. Well, why? Just come. No, you know what? I got time with my kids. I'm getting this podcast running or my business has to be dialed in because I have some dreams and aspirations for this. And, and this is the time I've allocated towards this. I've already said yes to this. I can't say no to it. So I appreciate it, but I got to say no. And so that's how you start shifting. So most people, they haven't said yes to anything. They have no pathway or process to get where they want to get to sort of winging it, doing too much work. And they really haven't been able to take things off the plate. And so if you can do those few things, it allows you to have way more peace in life. I agree completely. And as far as a process, when it comes to getting fit, one of my programs, just like you said, someone needs to follow a certain process that's worked. You know, I have a program, they follow it, it's got everything they need. If they follow it, put in the work to succeed. But the problem is, one is, is you're competing with 10 million other fitness people out there. And that's the struggle is trying to reach people and say, you know what, this doesn't have to be super complicated. I'm not going to sell you some yeah. miracle pill or some quick fix fat loss shortcut. But there are a million people that will sell them that. And unfortunately, you know, I yeah. see it and you see it every day in social media. I spend a lot of time on social media and it's constantly yeah. bombarded by these quote unquote experts that have 300,000 Instagram followers, but it's absolute for. bullshit. But people see, whoa, man, this guy's got all these followers. He must know what he's talking about. I think I'll pay nineteen ninety nine for his program. And then it just, it's a never ending cycle. And so it really bothers me and it shouldn't, but that's why I'm committed to doing it the right way. And it's, for me, it's been a much slower process. I have friends that are making 20 times, 50 times what I'm making, just being fitness marketers. But that, in my opinion, I mean, it's just not helping people in the right way. I mean, you're just this faceless person behind a sales page and you're selling the shit out of a program for whatever. And that's it. There's no connection. You know, you don't know if it's really working. I mean, that just bothers me. And so that's why I do what I do anyway. Yeah, I feel it, man. I, I've been there. I think it's the same concept when it boils down to it. It's like us trying to make sure that we we become the difference. And mm -hmm. it's hard because if you don't play by the rules of the game, you never win the game. And sadly, those are the rules of the game. The, the, the thing is making sure that you become, one, get yourself in the game. And it sucks to have to do some of the same things that people do that may not like to do. But if that means you can get other people client-wise out of their way to experience what it is you do, it's part of our duty to do that. Like, you know, there's people I talk to. I have a couple calls today. Actually, one, as soon as we get done, I got a call with a guy who's, you know, way out two different programs. And one of the big things I, I talk to people about is like, look, I, I'm not going to sell you a piece of the pie. Like a lot of people that they, in all aspects of all industries, they get a piece of the pie. Like in business, get this thing. The reason your business is sucking right now is you have no leads. Okay. It's a piece of it. But if I give you a thousand leads right now, if the rest of your business isn't organized, 
you have a thousand pissed off clients. <laughs> like you're not going to make anything <laughs> alone, right? Yeah. So you don't need just that. Or, hey, I'm going to teach you to make an online course and it's going to be the best course in the world. Okay, cool. I spent all my time on a course and no one buys it because I have no leads or no follow up or no delivery system. Like all these things that aren't really built in, or here's an autoresponder for follow up process. Right. Well, how do I get the leads in there? And, you know, so all these little pieces. And I was like, dude, no one's given them the foundation. It's like there's the piece of the pie or the baking pan that the pie goes into. I want to give people the baking pan and then say, here are the pieces of pie you should go seek out. Because in the world of what it is we do, we just got to step back for a moment and look at like, how do I get in the game that people are playing? And then how do I play it better? That's really all you got to do. Where, where are these people at? What is it that they're promising? Promise similar to the same thing in your own different, unique way. And then over deliver and then show the world, look what I do. It's not scammy. It's not cheesy. It's just the world of business and marketing. And the faster we get into that game and play it better, the better results we do. And the better results you have, the more you scale and grow. Yeah, well said. Listen, I'll wrap it up here, but I really appreciate your time with this. It's been a really great conversation and I appreciate it. And if you want folks to find you, is anthonytrucks.com the best spot? Yeah. So if you're uh, in the realm of just trying to be a better human being, go to anthonytrucks.com. If you want help on business, go to the fastentrepreneur.biz. And I have what's called a 50-minute fast business blueprint, which is the beginning of making that that pan. We'll say it's it's how to how to be able to build out the perfect profitable next step for you in fifteen minutes or less of your business. Awesome, cool, man. And remember, guys, if you aren't taking care of yourself first, you can't take care of your family the best way possible. If you're interested in joining our brotherhood, head over to Facebook. It's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash fit dad base camp. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Thanks, Anthony. Very welcome, my man. Thanks for joining us. And remember, if you want more information, check out the Fit Dad Basecamp group on Facebook. And don't forget to stop by fitdadnation.com. Until next time, keep kicking ass and taking the next step. You can do this, Dad. Dad.